Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I am here today at the Rock Island Auction Company taking a look at a whole bunch of revolvers which are not actually Colts. These are all what are called Brevet Colt revolvers in the collector's parlance. These are all fakes, copies, and, well, licensed copies and unlicensed copies. How about that? Uh, Sam Colt, of course, patented this rather revolutionary uh, concept of combining the action of the hammer with the action of the cylinder of a revolver. Colt had a lot of patents, but by far the most important one was that, the idea that when you cock the hammer, the cylinder is automatically rotated to its next position and then locked in place. Pa Colt came up with this idea pretty early. This was fundamental to his very earliest Patterson guns, and so he started patenting it in 1835 and 1836, and he patented it both in Europe and the United States, smart guy, planning ahead there. Um, he got his U.S. patent in 1836, he got his Belgian patent in 1835, I believe he got his French patent in 1835, those are the three most important ones. Uh, also a U.K. patent in, I believe, also 35. And this protected him. Now, it's interesting that the copies started appearing as early as the 1830s. People saw the Patterson guns and thought, wow, that's a good idea, why didn't I think of that? Well, who cares? He thought of it, but I can still make them. And they started producing copies. And this was illegal if it was done in a country where Colt had a, a patent in force. But that doesn't stop people from doing it. And during these Patterson days in the late 1830s, Colt's business didn't go very well. In fact, it went pretty poorly. And in 1840, the Patterson concern completely fell apart. Out of business, bankrupt, done. So there are a small number of copies of Patterson-era guns that are out there and that were made. Colt was in no position to be trying to you know, file international lawsuits and track down these people. It just didn't happen. Uh, Colt comes back into the, the realm of a successful business after 1847 when he gets an order from Captain Walker of the Texas Rangers and makes a, a large sale of Walker horse pistols which he follows with the, the Colt 1848 Dragoons and then the 1849 Pockets. And ultimately, the Colt 1851 Navy was a particularly successful revolver. That one really hit the big time. The Pockets were very popular too, and the Navies. And at this point, people copying his work really start to take off all over Europe, and in the United States too, for that matter. And it's in 1851 that Colt really actually starts enforcing his patents, primarily in Belgium. Uh, Belgium, specifically the Liège area, has long been a center of firearms manufacture, especially firearms manufactured by small shops, a lot of copies of things. There were, some, don't get me wrong, there were some very talented gun makers in Liège, but there were also a lot of really cut-rate crude shops as well. So it comes to Colt's attention that people are making fake Colt guns. Um, some of them are making guns with their own names that just copy, uh, you know, infringe on Colt's patents. Some of them are marking the guns Colt and trying to pass them off as being American Colt high quality guns. And this really makes him quite upset. Um, he was not necessarily the most even handed or even tempered guy. And the idea of someone else not just infringing his patent, but trying to infringe on his company's good name really pissed him off. So he set up a program to try and enforce this patent. Now, Part of the problem is most of these copies are being made by little like one-man, two-man, three-man shops. They don't really have any money. If he spends the money to actually take them to court across the Atlantic Ocean, which is going to take him away from all of his other business and be a huge hassle and, and inconvenience for him, even if he wins, which he almost certainly would, what does he get? He gets the satisfaction of crushing this little shop, but it's not like they have any money that he can get. So that's not a practical solution. What he comes up with instead, on the advice of one of his lawyers, was to set up a licensing fee. So he recruits a guy named uh, Monsieur de Vosera in Liège, who acts as his agent with the Liège Proof House. Now, firearms are proofed in the United States by government edict. They're proofed by the companies making them. But in most of Europe, any firearm sold commercially has to go through a proof house, a formal centralized proof house, and be safety tested. Well, if you stick your agent at the proof house, you can intercept all the copies that are coming through to be proofed. Now, for sure, some of these guys who are making knockoff guns are going to skip the proof house, and they're going to put their own fake proofs on the gun, too. 
Not necessarily a lot you can do about that. But the more legitimate gun makers who wanted to copy Colt patent because that's the, you know, the newest technology and it's what people really wanted, a lot of these guys still did very good work. So you can, you can get them to pay you if you have a guy at the proof house. And what Devocera did was he would inspect any Colt copy guns that came in and assuming that they met with Colt's quality standards, because Colt didn't want to uh, be seen as supporting anything that was a piece of junk, uh, assuming the gun met with Colt standards, he would then stamp Colt Brevet, which means Colt patent, on the gun. He would charge the manufacturer 10 francs, which was a, eh, not a huge amount of money, but not trivial either. Um, it was a, a low enough bar that people were willing to pay it. It was a high enough bar that there were some people who tried to make their own fake Colt Brevet stamps uh, to avoid paying that. Anyway, he would take their 10 francs, which by the way, he got to keep one franc of. The other nine went to Colt. That was his, his salary was a 10% share of the, the royalties that he collected. And stamp the thing Colt Brevet, and out it goes for sale. And someone can get a gun that is high quality. It's not American-made Colt. Colt still gets a licensing fee, though, to recognize his patent rights. So this was a pretty good situation for everyone. And this was set up in 1851. And between the winter of 51 and the spring of 1853, uh, Devocera collected 17,550 francs in royalty fees. So like 1,750 revolvers came through the Liège proof house that were effectively Colt copies. Now, the Belgian patent for, uh, there's an interesting side note here. Because Colt patented these guns in 1836 with his Patterson, but then it wasn't until the late 1840s that he really had a successful gun and a successful company, he didn't necessarily get the same duration of patent protection that he would have had the Patterson taken off right away. So his Belgian patent actually expired in 1854. So, you know, when this 10 franc licensing fee came to be, there were a number of shops that just decided, you know what, forget it, we'll just wait mm, 18 months, a year, two years, whatever it is at that exact period, and then the patent will expire, and then we can do whatever we want. Um, a lot of people, I think, mistake or confuse patents and copyrights, uh, especially today, copyrights are some, have some ludicrous length of enforceability. It's like from the death of the, the creator of content plus 70 years, the patent is enforceable. Basically, it's every time Mickey Mouse comes close to becoming public domain, people lobby Congress to extend copyright protections. However, patents are not the same. Patents at this time, in fact, they changed right around this period, went from 14 years to 17 years in the United States, and 14 years was pretty standard in the rest of the world. Now, you could uh, lobby for a seven-year extension as well, and Colt got an extension in the U.S., so his patent on this connection between the hammer and the cylinder extended until 1857 in the United States, but it ended in 1854 in Belgium. Um, actually, in Belgium, he got a four-year extension, which took him to 1854. So it's around, you know, in the 1850s, this patent is expiring. So his opportunities to get royalties only lasted a couple years uh, because he had this big kind of empty blank space where between when the Patterson failed and when he managed to get the 48 and 49 and 51 models that were very successful. Uh, by the way, there are copies. Pretty much everything we've got on the table here today is a 36 caliber. There are 44 caliber brevet Colt guns, Colt copies, but they're pretty rare. Mostly what was uh, popular and in demand in Europe was the 31 and the 36 caliber versions. So it wasn't just in Europe. Colt also enforced his patents legally in the United States. Um, in particular, there was a fairly landmark case in 1851 when he sued the Massachusetts Firearms Company, or the Manhattan Firearms Company, I'm sorry, uh, for infringing on his patent, and he won that pretty handily. With all that history in mind, the, these Colt copies, both licensed and unlicensed, really run the gamut from total junk to really nice guns that are probably every bit as good as an original Colt-produced revolver. And they're kind of an underappreciated area of study. It, there's not that long ago, a really good book came out documenting hundreds of these guns, which is a really nice boon to the people who are interested in them. Among really hardcore Colt collectors, they've always kind of been a, an ignored subject. You know, oh, well, those are the crappy fakes. We don't care about those. We'll ignore them. But in reality, in some ways, they're more interesting than genuine Colts because there's a lot more variety and 
neat features to them. So I have nine of them here on the table, ranging from really nice ones to decent ones to you might not want to do. That's kind of the, the ick side. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a moment and take a look at each of these and see what it is that makes them special. Let's start with a nice example, and this is a really nice example. Um, a couple things to look for. On a legitimate licensed Colt copy, you will find this mark, Colt Brevet, on the back end of the barrel. Stamped in place, it's usually not quite square to the barrel. And that was Monsieur de Vos Serra, uh, stamping those guns, indicating that they were in fact Colt approved guns. After, shortly after this uh, f licensing program really started to take off for Colt, he decided to also start sending parts to Belgium uh, to be used. So uh, originally he had, he had authorized just a couple of higher end manufacturers to actually make forgings, to make the raw components for the cylinders, the frames, the barrels, etc. And that was causing some problems because th it, it just didn't work very well. And it was suggested to him, and he thought it was a fantastic idea, that he could sell some of these raw parts made in Hartford, Connecticut, over to Belgium. He could charge gunsmiths to buy those, and then he could charge them again the licensing fee on the complete guns. And that actually worked reasonably well. Uh, so some of these guns you will find with authentic Colt parts of various types, because authentic Colt parts did go over there. Um, but not always, and you'll generally, you'll never find one that's all original Colt, because not every little part was sent over. So. Um, this is a particularly nice gun. It's well made. It handles well. Uh, it has a half cock notch, which is nice. Um, just really good example. You'll notice the barrel still has really nice bluing on it. Uh, let's see. The finish on this one isn't quite so good, but mechanically, this is also a very nice example. You'll see there we again have Colt Brevet stamped on it. Our cylinder scene is rather different. That cylinder, uh, the cylinder scene on a Colt revolver was one of Colt's kind of trademark characteristics. He had commissioned some uh, master engravers to make the scene, the, the roll dies, for those scenes for the different models of Colt revolver, and that was something that was very difficult to fake. So a lot of Belgian manufacturers, they didn't try to actually like copy the exact scene, because maybe people wouldn't be able to identify what scene was supposed to be on a particular gun. But what they did do instead, in order to maintain the same style as Colt, was to put a roll engraved scene of some sort on the cylinder. So this one's got some, some game birds there and some trees and that sort of thing. You'll find all sorts of different engraving and scenery on these Colt brevets. So it's really small, but I should also point out these are Belgian proofed, so we've got an ELG in an oval here on the cylinder. Uh, that you will definitely find on any legitimate Belgian copy, because that was required under Belgian law. You can also see on the better examples, they'll have serialized parts in the same way that original Colts do. So the trigger guard, the frame, the barrel are all serialized there, just like a, a legitimate Colt. Now here's another really nice example. This one was actually made as a factory engraved revolver. And right off the bat, you can see that this started off as an octagonal barrel that has been turned down through most of its uh, length. Kind of gives it an interesting little uh, style flare there. And then there is engraving on the side plates, the back strap, the front strap, and elsewhere. If we look at the top of the barrel, we'll see that Colt Brevet marking. And then in addition on this one, the manufacturer has actually engraved his name very nicely on the barrel. And this is a dead giveaway that this is a legitimate licensed version of the gun. Because if you were making an illegitimate copy and wanted to avoid the fees, you would never put your name on it. Because that was one really easy way for someone to track you down and figure out who was making fake guns. Um, but these guys were very proud of their work and legitimately, rightfully so. They marked their guns with their name. They paid Colt his licensing. They were doing everything by the book. You can see that we have another different cylinder scene here. There's our Belgian proof mark on the cylinder, and we've got some hunting dogs there. This one's a little gummy from hardened grease, but really nice. Take a look at the engraving. That's, you know, that that is talented engraving. This isn't, you know, crappy, you know, smoky 
off the, the alley kind of backyard gun maker. This is a professional guy with a lot of talent. Uh, it's serial numbered as well. I've got the engraving there, engraving on the back strap. This piece is really every bit as good of a gun as a true Colt. Now let's take a look at a few examples that aren't quite as nice, or perhaps are a little sketchier. This one, for example, it looks pretty decent. Um, you know, generally in the pattern of an 1851 Navy. It's got a nice bright finish on it still, nice case hardening on, on a lot of the non-blued parts. But there's something interesting on the barrel. So if we take a look up here, we'll see Colt Brevet, which looks correct, but we also have a Colt address. Address Sam Colt, New York City. You can, if you look closely, you can see some horizontal lines there. Those are basically uh, lines for the engraver to use to keep all his letters in a row. And if this were an authentically stamped Colt barrel, that would have been, well, stamped. It would not have been hand engraved. That marking is clearly hand engraved, which uh, is a kind of a giveaway that this is almost certainly an illegitimate copy. This is a counterfeit gun. Someone has added that marking in an attempt to fool you into thinking it is an original American Colt when it really isn't. Now, whether that's a, a legitimate or a fake Colt Brevet stamp, no way to know that. But once, once you see that, uh, that hand engraved address line that should raise some real questions, both today as a collector trying to figure out what you're looking at and back in the 1840s or 50s as a consumer trying to figure out exactly what you were buying. Now in this case, we've got a little stamp at each cylinder indicating that every cylinder has been proofed. Um, I believe this is German. You'll notice as well that the brass color on the, the trigger guard here is wearing away and it's actually silver underneath. Uh, this is not, in fact, a solid brass or solid gunmetal part like it should be. Uh, it's just plated. So another indication of kind of a, a lower budget counterfeit thing masquerading as something better than it really is. Here's another example. This one, we're getting a little bit less, a little bit away from the Colt style. So for instance, this grip frame is kind of at a different angle. It's got a, a square backed grip. A lot of these parts are clearly made uh, by the presumably Belgian uh, shop that made this one. Now this is a legitimate Brevet Colt. So this has been, this is a licensed copy, but yeah, the mechanics aren't quite as good on it. Probably a little cheaper. There's the barrel mark. I actually have a pretty decent cylinder scene on this one. Come on, it's got a half cock notch here somewhere. There we go. We've got a decent cylinder scene on this one. You'll see some way worse ones in just a minute. That's kind of a, an intermediate quality example. Now, this is a German produced example. Uh, it is an illegal copy because it is not marked with anything up here. Either that or it was manufactured after the, the patents expired. Could go either way. This one again appears to be a reasonably decent quality, but it's definitely straying a bit from uh, being an exact copy of a Colt. The front sight is substantially different. You can see that. Now it's bigger, which is kind of nice, except that the rear sight, the downside here is the rear sight is virtually non-existent. So that's, that's kind of an iffy uh, proposition there. They didn't bother to put a cylinder scene on this one at all. Either that or it was very lightly done and has worn off now. Uh, no markings on the barrel. In fact, no markings at all. A few little stray serial numbers here. Notice that the front of the trigger guard here is shaped instead of being square. Uh, I don't see any proof marks on this one at all, which uh, would be another indicator that it's probably an unlicensed and illegal copy. On the other hand, it does have some nice checkered grips to it and uh, you know, little other aesthetic features like the, the barrel having this nice bevel to it kind of a different rifling pattern than you'd normally see in a, a proper Colt as well. 
And now we come to some of the really crappy guns. This one is, it's funny that this one is sort of, it's intended to be engraved, but it's really bad engraving. Uh, take a look at the back strap here. I think that's supposed to be flowers, I guess, or scroll work, but it really kind of looks like a kid's doodle instead. Uh, not, not good, not good. There's some of that on the bottom there as well. We've got a little bit of it on the trigger guard. The gun's serialized, but boy, the engraving is not good. So the cylinder engraving is equally amateurish. And if we look at the top of the barrel, we see a Colt Patton stamp. That's not Colt Brevet, and when these were being licensed by Colt, they didn't use a stamp like that. What this suggests is that this is a gun that was made after the patent expired, and this is an attempt to convince people that this is a, an approved licensed Colt gun, when it's actually not. Uh, there's no way this would have passed Colt's uh, uh, quality standards. The machine work actually looks reasonably decent, but that, uh, that engraving would just kill this thing. Now here's one where the machine work is not so great. This is actually a Russian copy. A um, lot of variations here, obviously, from the Colt standard. Uh, you've got different profile of the hammer. This trigger guard is very much different. The profile of the grip is different. The recoil shield and the capping uh, cutaway are different. This is this is kind of a vaguely Colt-shaped gun. Um, and again, a spurious patent mark here, S. Colt patent. I suppose you had some plausible deniability. You could claim that, well, you're just trying to inform people that this uses the Colt patent and not trying to get them to think Colt made it at all. No, certainly not. Um, hopefully not, because Sam Colt would be really pretty peeved if he saw you trying to sell this under his name, I suspect. does have a lanyard loop on the butt. All right, and we'll wrap this up with one more Belgian gun. This is clearly someone's, uh, someone decided to take, make their own take on what the, uh, the grip style and overall shape of a proper revolver ought to be, and you end up with this unique design. Uh, this is Belgian. It is an unlicensed gun, so we have nothing, nothing up here. Uh, could have been before the, could have been while the patent was in force, and uh, an unlicensed copy. Could have been afterwards when it was just another gun that used this mechanism that was now available to anybody. But our Colt patent style loading lever as well. Actually a pretty decent cylinder scene on this one. A little heavily faded there, heavily worn. Colt Patton there on the cylinder scene. He's going to be annoyed if he finds you out. Now, all this shouldn't be taken to mean that this wasn't a perfectly functional revolver. It's an interesting grip style, different, kind of cool, but uh, definitely not an authentic and approved Colt copy. So that's the sort of thing that makes this field of Colt Brevet pistols really interesting. Thank you for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Hopefully, you've learned something new today about Colt copy revolvers, because you know what? It's a, actually a really cool field, and there's a lot of interesting things to see in, in this realm. Uh, I'm fortunate here to have nine different ones that we're able to take a look at today. These came from at least one, if not a couple, of different collections that fortuitously ended up together. So if you're interested in any of these, they are all coming up for sale. There is an elaborate list uh, in the description text below of links to Rock Island's catalog pages for each of these. They're all, each one's sold individually. They're not a batch. So if you're interested in some or all or only one of them, take a look at those links. You can check out Rock Island's descriptions and photos, and you can place bids on any you might be interested in, either over the phone, on the website, or here live at the auction in person. Thanks for watching.